Gavin Wood's crypto journey started with Ethereum. He was one of the eight original founders and the project CTO in the early days. Today though, he's busy building Polkadot, a chain that's attempting to improve where Ethereum falls short. After years of development, the ecosystem's first applications are finally coming to life and it aims to lay the foundations to become a layer zero, where multiple layer one chains and their apps can flourish. So where does Gavin's story begin? Gavin, I'm so thrilled to have you on the Defined podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Lovely to be here, Camilla. Yay. Um, okay, so uh, Gavin, of course, is the founder of Parity Technology and uh, of the Polkadot blockchain. He is also co-founder of Ethereum. Um, Polkadot is now uh, the 11th largest cryptocurrency by market cap at around 20 billion, uh, while the chain is the sixth largest proof of stake chain with around 11 billion in stake value. The last few months have been pivotal uh, for Polkadot with parachain auctions going live, laying the groundwork for applications to be built on the Polkadot ecosystem. And we'll get into all of that. Uh, but before we do, um, I wanted to start with your uh, like pre polka dot life uh, and how your your background in and your path in crypto started obviously with ethereum so if you can uh, if we can start with like how you got interested in crypto and um your role at ethereum uh sure um well uh i got uh, i got interested in crypto i guess I think I saw a story about Bitcoin back in 2011 on the uh, Geek News site Slashdot, um, and I kind of thought about buying some then, but then I it was too much effort, so I didn't bother. Um, I guess a lot of people are the same. And then uh, it came up again in 2013. It was a, a story in the Guardian newspaper about like uh, these kind of uh, crypto um, crypto guys, I don't know, uh, crypto punks, whatever cypherpunks uh and they had this guy miyataki who was uh, living in a squat at the time in south london um and it was a pretty uh kind of romantic kind of article like in the sort of you know classic sense of romanticism so it had like you know a picture of this uh hooded um uh, guy that looked like he hadn't changed his clothes in quite a few months uh, with like uh the uh, city of london the financial center one of the major financial centers of the world in the background uh with amir basically saying were taking on these guys um and this this came not that long after the financial crisis so it was early 2013 so you know four or five years um so it's still very much fresh in everyone's minds and um yeah it it it, it was an interesting uh, article and it, it was enough to get me to uh, reach out to to this guy and let him know i was um i was kind of interested in in the in this in this world i suppose um and uh it was from there that i met some of the other people in the uh, crypto ecosystem i actually didn't uh, didn't have that much um we didn't talk that much to amir um until about a year later um when i got to know him um actually having sort of co-founded ethereum but um back then he introduced me to a couple of uh, interesting people that i would later uh, one of whom i would later employ and the other that i that i would stay in touch with for a, a long while um what about kind of this this uh, idea of um like defying traditional finance i mean y you mentioned uh this kind of like romantic I idea of uh like these uh techies and geeks living in a squad uh, wearing hoodies um looking at the like the city of london in the background that appealed to you why do you think it did well, I, I mean, I don't know if the idea was so romantic, but the um, looking at how how uh, how long it had been since he'd had a wash, but the um, the thing that was romantic was was more the illustration, the image that it that it presented, which is to say, there was there were some like scruffy coders um, that that you know uh, were were sort of trying to take on this um, you know demonstrably broken financial system, and um, they seemed to like have a pretty good idea about what they were doing. Um, so it was, 
it, it, that coupled with some of the other stuff that was going on at the time, early 2013 was basically when Silk Road came to prominence. And, uh, you know, we had this, uh, there were a few articles that I read about that as well. I, I wasn't really sort of into this um, area of technology, um, not much anyway, up until then. And then I, I sort of, um, it, it, you know, there was a particular article I seem to remember reading that where the the author of the article had actually ordered some stuff off Silk Road in, you know, for um, journalistic uh, reasons in order to, um, you know, demonstrate that this was actually possible um, and apparently not too difficult. And it was it was this that really, together with the romantic imagery from this from this squat, I actually went to the squat and what really wasn't that romantic. Um, it it was. Um, it sort of gave me the impression that this was uh, this was going to be quite disruptive, and um, it was going to cause change. And I, I guess you know that that in and of itself is kind of enough to make one curious. Um, and I wanted to understand the technology better. And then you know part of understanding a technology is, for me at least, is implementing it. You know, it's just it's just you know writing it out like. Uh, if you you never really know if you truly understand an idea until you can actually use the idea. Do you think by now, um, it, is is it is it fair to say that uh, that um, that initial kind of inkling that uh, blockchain and crypto would uh, disrupt the financial system? Do you think it that's already happened? Like, is it is it playing out? Like, do you think that's is it safe to say that you were right in that uh, in thinking that back then? Um, I think I was right in identifying that it was a disruptive technology, um, but we I don't think I don't think the real major disruption has has really to the financial system at least has really mm -hmm. happened yet. I think the main thing is that this technology, you know, we're going to keep, it's going to keep getting developed. It's going to, it's going to keep getting polished. It's going to keep uh, becoming more usable. And what the, one of two things will happen. Either it will become usurped and much like the internet did, it will fall prey to centralized um, interests. Um, or it will demonstrate itself to be, um, absolutely necessary for society to move forward and it will do this simply by um, there being more financial meltdowns in the traditional finance um, system um, and it will provide the alternative path and sooner or later like whether whether because it's actually outperforming um, uh, sort of day-to-day -day, the traditional financial um, services and, uh, sector or whether it's whether it's necessary because the traditional financial services simply cannot provide the services anymore because it's broken. Um, I don't know, but I don't know which one of those two it's going to be. Um, but assuming that, that this is the disruptive technology that, that I identified it as, then uh, one of those two things, I guess, has to happen. Okay, so it's still, to you, blockchain tech is still proving itself out. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think there's a, a while to go in the journey yet. What would you have to see for, for that to like become a reality? Um, I think uh, the main the main thing I would look for, I mean, so to be honest, the financial side of this has never interested me that much. It, it, it's, it's in, you know, it, I'm sure it's kind of interesting, but the thing that I sort of, um, the thing that kept me interested is really this concept of, uh, of an applications platform, this like alternative web. And um, in those terms, what I would really be looking to see is uh, if someone comes along and wants to make a, a web service, like a, a service that everyone can access on, on the internet, um, the web has been traditionally the, um, the set of technologies, protocols that you will use to implement that. Um, and the thing that I would look for is are new developers that are coming to this looking to create a service, are they using web three technologies or are they using you know, 
more traditional centralized Web2 technologies. And if the technologies get to the point, if the adoption gets to the point that sort of newcomers naturally go to the Web3, then the Web2, then I would say we have we have reached the the point of adoption. Oh, interesting. Okay, so if it's if the default for developers uh, building web apps becomes uh, blockchain and Web3, then that means that blockchains have won <laughs> or they've kind of disrupted the system. At least Web3 has won. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, and well, speaking of uh, like platforms for applications, um, so how how did that in, initial kind of foray into um, investigating what crypto is lead you to to Ethereum and um, what was what was your role there? Uh, well, I, it, it sort of led me to Ethereum via a couple of these people that Amir Taki met. One in particular called Johnny Bitcoin, um, <laughs> and he uh, uh, he was a good friend of Vitalik. And it's through through him that we got introduced. Um, and then fast forward to December 2013, a few months later, and um, yeah, I was having a pint with uh, Johnny down the down the pub in London, and he was mentioning that there was this uh, project that that uh, Vitalik was looking to kick off called Ethereum, and he'd written this white paper. And uh, and since I was such a good coder, or <laughs> so he believed, so I uh, so so I had I'd given him to believe. Uh, I should be, I, I should, I should lend a hand. I should, I should help. So I said, yeah, all right, fine, I'll do it. And really it was, it was curiosity. It was like, uh, I was interested in learning more about it, but I wasn't so interested in re-implementing Bitcoin, but it was kind of an interesting proposition to implement, you know, a, a successor protocol. So um, I took a look at the white paper and I started coding it a few days later. And um, that sort of led me to, the rest of the uh, you know this, this sort of motley crew that were trying to found this this uh, Ethereum protocol, and um, in the I don't know in the weeks that followed, um, I sort of went from uh, core developer to CTO, and uh, uh, basically because there was no one else that understood the protocol better, and. Um, and then we, yeah, we, we moved to, uh, uh, you know, we got the Swiss foundation sorted, sort of moved in some sense to Switzerland and then all the rest of it. And, um, I guess there's not, uh, I don't know how much of this you want me to go into again, but um, it was, uh, yeah, it was a, a, a very interesting few um, a year or two. In 2021, Ethereum traders lost over $240 million to malicious bots exploiting their trades. Eden Network is a next-generation private transaction service for Ethereum, providing traders with MEV protection by submitting transactions directly to miners and away from the prying eyes of harmful bots. Eden Network recently launched Eden Rocket RPC, which compiles some of Ethereum's fastest private transaction networks. Eden Network is backed by Multicoin Capital, Alameda Research, Jump Capital, Wintermute, among many others. Join the best! Setting up Eden Rocket RPC takes less than two minutes. Get started now at rpc.edennetwork.io. Kevin was at the heart of Ethereum during its development years up until the launch of its mainnet. But in 2016, he chose to rent out and founded Parity Technologies, one of the main clients of Ethereum. Later on, he came up with the idea for Polkadot. What motivated him to start a new blockchain rather than keep building Ethereum? Um, a few things. Um, so yeah, I mean, in 2016, uh, you know, I was still doing quite a lot of, um, you know what, in, even in 2017, well, 2016, 2017, I was still doing a lot of Ethereum um, coding. 2016, I was doing core coding on the Parity Ethereum client. 2017, I moved on a little bit into like UI coding, doing some, um, um, some, some stuff around that. But it was late 2016 that I was I was really just thinking aloud how to uh, how we might do a, a sharded uh, chain like make do a scalable version um, of Ethereum, and um, it was a, it was while I was thinking this through that I realized that one of the elements that um, that would be part of this 
new sharded blockchain, this very scalable blockchain, um, was something that didn't it could it, it could be more general than than you know I had sort of previously assumed it would be for a sharded blockchain, and the way to make it general was going to be using this um, this language WebAssembly. Now WebAssembly is like this um, basically like it's a vir- it's it's a a language that allows web pages to specify computer programs um, that work on any browser. And they, they generally work fairly fast. They can work usually about half, about 50% of the speed of a normal, of if it's like a normal computer program. Um, and this is, this is really good. This is, allows, allows the web as a platform to exist. So you can, this is why we can have like video games on the web. It's why we can have stuff like Google Office and you know, Google Docs and all this sort of thing. It actually to really is one of these real important components that turns the web into a real uh, applications and games platform. And so essentially the idea was, well, let's let's reuse this technology, but let's do it so that each of the um, these individual shards, uh, so each of these individual like um, work tracks of the blockchain um, could have a much more um, uh, specialized piece of work that they focused on in the same way that one website might be specialized for a particular game and another website like Google Docs might be specialized for writing uh, Word documents. We would do the same, but with blockchains. And the idea is that you have these specialized blockchains and you tie them all together. So they're actually just shards of a single blockchain. Um, and that means that they can communicate with each other. And it also means that they can use the same underlying capital pool, the same underlying staking um, to secure them. Very important. And um, this, this I felt was a significant technological sort of difference that it made me want to work on it. Because I really didn't want to work on ETH2 that wasn't going to be the ETH2 that Ethereum was doing. Um, if it came to that, then uh, you know, I prefer just to... Well, Back in that those times, I, I, I would have preferred just to have you know, continued um, working uh, uh, working with Vitalik. But um, a couple of things conspired. Uh, so one of them was, hey, here's a different idea, and it's kind of interesting to explore. So curiosity was sort of pulling me in a different direction. Secondly, there really wasn't that much activity going on. ETH2 was very much a research project back then and even <laughs> a little bit still now. Um, so there wasn't that much to actually start coding. And I really wanted to be writing stuff um, that was going to be used. Um, and um, there was another reason as well, which was that I felt that the, the governance processes of Ethereum were opaque and wishy-washy, vague, um, I didn't. I didn't much like the um, uh, this this you know consensus, rough consensus. Everything happens offline. There are no really clear rules. Um, I felt that you know the thing that blockchain had. Well, one of the really important things that blockchain had provided us was the ability to have to say here are the rules and they will definitely be enforced. They'll definitely be followed and it will be transparent and it will be open. And I felt that though this this had obviously been used for you know financial services. Um, with the Bitcoin currency being the first one, it was um, it would be really good to use them also for the governance services that we kind of really needed to govern these decentralized protocols. And so I was uh, I was d- also drawn to making a protocol that had governance built in. And for that matter, if it had governance built in, wouldn't it be great if we could tie it directly into um, the upgradability, so that we don't have to do these horrible hard forks that we've been you know, sort of have, have gone in part oftentimes gone wrong um, on Ethereum, but definitely take an awful lot of, of, uh, of extra protocol consensus. So basically a lot of human consensus and to be honest, centralization, right? It's the, uh, if you look at Ethereum, for example, it's the Ethereum foundation that specifies um, what hard fork is the correct path for Ethereum. Um so I, I was I was very interested in exploring each of these sort of areas, and uh, they were not things I was going to get from from Ethereum. So eventually, I took the decision to uh, uh, yeah to push forward with Polkadot. Um, okay, I, I want to dig into kind of the uh, web assembly and, and sharding and and governance, but like one like superficial question: Why the name? Um, there's a few, there's a few factors in the name. Um, so the actual, 
so I like the name polka dot because there isn't a center to the polka dot pattern. Like most concepts have a center. Mm -hmm. uh, the concept of a cup has a center and it's in the middle somewhere. You know? This is a, it's mm -hmm. a centralized object. The center of the cup is not over here. It's definitely somewhere in the body of the around the, the body of the cup mm. and um and so you know if you look at traditional like if you look at like traditional like, iconography you look at traditional like naming it's really um it's really centered um around somewhere in the middle of the icon usually and I, with polka dot there was a it, it's this this concept of it just being all everywhere like uh, no no particular place um, in addition to that, it was kind of playful, which I quite liked. And it was different. It was different to all of the other things that just sound like math fi or sci-fi concepts. Um, and I feel that we really need to, as you know, if we're really trying to take this technology to people that don't care about having the cutting edge of technology, then we need to be appealing to something beyond math fi and sci-fi. We need to be like appealing to something that is tangible, that, that, that is within people's everyday lives. And so I felt polka dot was... Was, was quite nice from that kind of branding perspective. Um, the, it, in reality, Polkadot was, um, was the background of the white paper for, um, uh, for the Polkadot protocol. And uh, when it was originally written, the white paper, before I did the background, I did background right at the end. Um, mm. So uh, when I originally wrote it, it wasn't called Polkadot. It was called something else. It actually had two different names um, in it. Which ones? Uh, the first one, I, I'm a bit embarrassed to be honest, because they're fairly <laughs> terrible names. Uh, the first one was Interplex, um, and the second was Disparity. I'm, I'm happy with the second, oh, but really? it had such negative, yeah, because we were a parity, so it's like disparity and disparate mm. chains. Um, but, uh, you know, in the end, it felt a little negative. Uh, so, um, and Polka Dot felt more kind of fun and playful, and, you know, um, I, I think. Uh, uh, I think it's important to, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to acknowledge that at least a good portion of life should be about fun. I love it. And I, re I do remember uh, the white paper with the, the polka dot background. It was like like pinkish or like purplish uh, polka dot. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I remember that. Um, okay. So the... So ETH2 uh, has had been kind of thinking of, of sharding. Um, and so is it right that the main difference with with polka dot was the use of web assembly is that kind of like what what kind of the the big difference was that you wanted to experiment yeah this this web assembly was definitely a major component of the difference the differences there were a few others um how we approached charting how we approached the consensus algorithm Mm. Um, and these would, as, as the Polkadot protocol solidified and crystallized and we actually wrote it and implemented it, um, you know, obviously there are going to be differences, assuming that it's not just a carbon copy, but it you know, obviously wasn't because we did it first. Um, the, uh, so the big difference was in what we call the shards, um, statement, the state machine of the shards. And yes, indeed, uh, Ethereum's um, shard state machine was, to be honest, I'm not sure. This has changed so much over the course of ETH2, but I presume it's based around the EVM. But I, I don't, <laughs> please don't quote me on that. I haven't looked at their, their design for a long while. Um, ours was definitely, was very much based around WebAssembly. So it's this idea that you can write any computer program that you want uh, in any language that can build, compile to WebAssembly, which you know, opens up a lot of different languages. And you can really just write a blockchain um, but with the idea that the blockchain will be secured by Polkadot. So it will fit within the same security model as Polkadot. It will fit within the same staking capital pool as Polkadot. The same amount of stake uh, is at risk if um, someone um, or a group co co uh, coordinate an attack against your chain as if they would coordinate the attack against Polkadot. So there's, it, it, it's a, it really is a shard. It really is like as secure as Polkadot. But it can do something entirely different and it operates, it operates independently, which is to say it operates um, in parallel, like simultaneously work can happen on, on each of these shards as it can on each of the others. So um, it, it, the, key, the key difference, I guess, uh, in terms of, in some sense, pr the product 
is that with Polkadot, you kind of get the entire shard. You can lease out a shard. Whereas with Ethereum, with Ethereum, it was always about trying to take the Ethereum model and make it scalable. So, and the scalability generally comes from having these different work, um, um, uh, work tracks. So the sh different shards and having, uh, you know, some smart contracts executing on one and some smart contracts executing on another. I, and, you know, it was really about the, the, the thing that really kicked off Polkadot was saying, well, what if they don't have to be smart contract chains, these shards? What if they could be any kind of chain? What if one of them was just specialized to handle a name registry or one of them was specialized just for DeFi or one of them was specialized just for NFTs? Um, then it's, you know, rather than making them all smart contracts, does this, does this have an advantage, you know? Um, and it was, uh, it seemed to me that it, there was a definite um, argument that it would have an advantage because there are some very uh, like high throughput applications. Sometimes you just know that you're going to need to do a lot of transactions for this one particular application, like for example, DeFi. And it makes sense to be able to have um, this uh, specialization because you get a huge amount more performance through it. But furthermore, you get the ability to experiment. So you can actually try different ideas with different chains. You're not stuck into one single um, smart contract model. There are different there are different ways of doing even smart contracts. This idea that they're Turing complete, it's kind of true. Um, there's a few caveats to, to it being true. It's not really exactly true. But even within, even though it's Turing complete, there are a lot of different sort of ways of, of, of designing a smart contract system. And you can see this because there are several different chains out there now that have completely, well, that have, that have pushed forward different designs for smart contracts. Some of them work with um, them not being Turing complete. They work on languages that are guaranteed to halt after a little while. Um, and uh, some of them have storage fees. Some of them don't have storage fees. Some of them, you know, there are all sorts of different things that you can do. And it's, Experimentation is, in my mind, what made uh, blockchain great. It was like, it, it's an experiment. It's a new thing. And let's try this new thing. And maybe lots of different teams are going to try lots of different new things. So um, with Polkadot, the other thing that came to mind was, well, we can try, you know, we have 100 different parachains, 100 different shards, and we can try 100 different things at the same time. And they can, they're not just tied into this smart contract environment whose design decisions have already been fixed, but they can make their own design decisions. They're at the very, very sort of top level. They're blockchains. They can do their own, uh, make their own design decisions from the point of view of, of, of a blockchain. And this was, this uh, experimentation platform was, uh, was really what made me excited. Got it. Um, and are there, is there a limit to the amount of, of parachains? So parachains and shard is the same thing in, in yeah. Polkadot. That's okay. what we call shards. Okay. So is there a limit to, to the number of parachains on Polkadot? Um, I mean, almost certainly yes, uh, mm -hmm. but we haven't found it yet. Oh. <laughs> so we're going to keep rolling them out. And, mm -hmm. and as a limit comes along, we will, um, uh, we will, um, you know, optimize and, take whatever action is necessary. Um, but basically, um, one of the limits that we that we assumed early on mm -hmm. was, uh, was to do with message passing. So, you know, basically, if as you add on more parachains, then there's like more, um, more other parachains that each one might want to talk to. So it's like mm -hmm. when you add on the second parachain, then they can, only, they, they can only talk to one other parachain because there's only two in the system. This A can talk to B and B can talk to A. But when you add on the 101st parachain, then now every parachain, all 101 of them, can talk to 100 other parachains, which means if you think of it in terms of the total amount of connections, then there's now 10,000 connections because, mm -hmm. yeah, because it's, it's a multiplier. Well, I, I mean, it, it, of the order of 10,000 connections because it's a multiplier. Um, and this is uh, this is commonly what's called like network effect. It's like it's the same reason that Facebook had this snowball effect because it became for every extra person, it became more than that, more more useful than the person before. Like right. pro rata, like proportionally, it became even more useful than the, per than the person before because when it's the set when there's a network of two people, then it's like 
why would you ever bother joining? But when it's a network of a billion people, then it's like, well, if I want to join any network, it has to be this one because there can only be, like there's no other network that connects a billion people. So, um, so yeah, basically this, this um, message passing becomes, we believe, became more expensive because it was of the order of, of, of the square, so it's, uh, of the number of, of, of total uh, chains. So basically, mm. as you add an extra chain on, it becomes much, much more um, costly to, uh, to pass all these messages. And it turns out that uh, we have an algorithm now, so we have a way of doing a design that allows us um, to avoid this issue. And so actually, we are much more confident that we can actually go much higher than our original um, uh, expectation of 100. And it, it may end up being in the hundreds. But realistically, there's going to be some limit, um, and uh, we will work our way towards it. And uh, okay. we have other designs um, that, that will uh, help us scale even beyond this limit. Right. Okay. So the limit comes from when it, it, it starts to become too expensive for all the different parachains to message between each other. Basically, yeah. yeah. Okay. And you expect that to be within the hundreds when that limit comes? We'll see. Um, okay. It's, it's At least 100, very... like is 100 kind of a good number to say that's kind of what Polkadot can, can take. That's what we have. That's what we've said in the past. And with our new design, we expect it to be more than that. So okay. we, it may even be, I mean, two, three, four hundred, five hundred. You know, we don't know quite yet. Um, and realistically, um, it's actually possible that it, the the bottleneck won't be with the message passing, but will actually be with the overall uh, finality algorithm. So we have this this finality algorithm. It's called Grandpa. Mm -hmm. um, and for it to work, it needs to uh, it needs all of the validators to basically talk to each other. So all the validators have to talk to all the other validators, um, and uh, they don't have to talk very much. Like it's very simple, the sort of talking that they're doing. But nonetheless, it all validators have to talk to all others. And we have this, we have the the number of validators has to be ten times the number of parachains. So this is where you get the problem, right? So we've got like, if it, suppose you have a million parachains, now you have to have 10 million validators, which means um, all 10 million validators have to talk to uh, 9,999,999 other validators. So you've, you, you suddenly have to have this huge amount more, um, uh, more, more traffic for each validator. Every validator now has to have this vast amount more bandwidth and uh, that reduces um, uh, the, the, the decentralization of the network because it basically means validators have to have very, very specialized equipment sitting at a data center with huge amounts of, uh, of, of bandwidth. So we don't really want to, uh, we don't want to like end up effectively centralized in that way like some of some other protocols which are willing to trade off decentralization well we don't want to trade off decentralization we consider it very important and so what we um and so we'll we will likely for for sort of polka dot end it uh, well not end it, but like get the um uh end our experimentation end our uh, validator increase at the point where we um uh where we uh feel that the, the bandwidth required for um, for any given validator is is getting to the point where it would be um, um, uh, unreasonable for any um, uh, normal actor to, to be able to provide. Um, but overall, yes, if you want a number, then I would say um, somewhere maybe one, 100 to 250 is, is really where we're targeting. Have you heard of Oasis Network? Oasis is a scalable, privacy-enabled blockchain that surpassed $100 million in TVL within 12 hours from launch. They recently announced a $200 million ecosystem fund dedicated to helping projects build on the network and is supported by investors including Pantera, Binance Lab, Dragonfly, and Electric Capital. It's one of the two most invested in blockchains, according to Messari, and has a partner ecosystem that includes Fortune 500 companies. Oasis aims to be a hub for DeFi with its lower gas fees versus Ethereum, high throughput, privacy protection, and defense against MEV. 
the Wormhole Bridge and the new Yuzu Swap decks are both live on Oasis. Through Yuzu Swap, users can participate in liquidity pools, swap, trade, and earn rewards with high APY. Visit oasisprotocol.org and yuzuswap.com to learn more. Substrate Parachains Kusama The Polkadot ecosystem can be complex and confusing. In this section, Gavin explains how each piece fits together. The main point is that Polkadot aims to give developers the flexibility to build decentralized apps as they see fit and in a scalable infrastructure. Yeah, that's right. So scaling is an important one. And this, mm -hmm. the scaling that we that we do through these parachains, these shards, um, is two twofold. Right? One of them is we've split the workload. So it can like it's like having instead of having just one one person who's doing a bunch of work in an office, it's like they can hand it out to a hundred different people and they can go away and do the work in pattern, you know, in the, uh, in, 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 in their own offices and then come back mm -hmm. and hand the work back to the original, uh, the original person. So it's, um, this is a very simple sort of concept, parallelization. Mm -hmm. you know. The other way is by having, uh, by these shards being the, what we say domain specific so basically it's like the shards are um a, 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 a built to perform very well at doing a very particular kind of work so it's like you wouldn't give accounts your accounts job to a doctor to do right because doctors do medicine and accountants do accounts but the idea is that um with with polka dot you can have a shard that is for it's great at doing accounts and another shard that's like great at handling I don't know, NFTs and another shard that's great at doing um, reputation stuff and another shard that's great at doing government governance stuff, right? And these are domain specific, which means they can get through their workload faster. So we get scalability through the performance gains, um, which are delivered by not being general. So a, a platform like Ethereum, very general, uh, you know, through its smart contracts, it's like jack of all trades, but master of none. So the idea was to say, right, well, in, in, in Polkadot, we can have some jack of all trades chains, sure, but let's have some master chains as well that are really good at doing some particular thing, like very performant at doing some particular thing. So the scalability was um, was very important. But also the other thing that, that you know, as, as when you make new technology, you only come to realize some of the repercussions later on after you've built it and are using it. And one of the things that I came to realize later on with Polkadot is that with uh, with smart contract platforms, they are they're, they're perfectly good for for doing smart contracts. But a lot of what is happening on these smart contract platforms is not really a smart contract workload. What they what what a lot of um, uh, a lot of the uh, users of Ethereum are uh, fall into two categories. Um, one of them are, uh, are, are people who want to deploy, like launch a decentralized application, right? So they have this idea of a decentralized application, Web3 application maybe. They, want, they, they, they built it using smart contracts and they launch it. Right, that's one user set. Another user set are the, the people that want to use that decentralized application. Right, so that decentralized application is users. Now, for some, that the issue is with with smart contract platforms like Ethereum that the users they don't want to use Ethereum. Right, they they don't want to they don't care about Ether. They want to use they, they want to use the decentralized application. So a lot of the users of Ethereum. Don't want to use Ethereum, and if if a decentralized application can come along on a platform where the user doesn't need to worry about the underlying platform's token or any of any of that stuff, then that's going to be better for the user, right? Because they don't they don't care about the underlying platform of the of the, of the decentralized application that they want to use. Similarly, decentralized application providers don't especially want to have to work their decentralized application into several smart contracts smart contracts are not necessarily sometimes they can be but not necessarily how you want to architect or implement your decentralized application oftentimes smart contract environments um, force certain design decisions on you that you really didn't want to, to make that you didn't you, that they're against how you would normally implement software and architect software and um, with uh, with polka dot 
we want to return that entire sort of design spectrum back in the hands of the decentralized application developers. And furthermore, we don't want to intermediate Polkadot getting getting in there. We don't want to get it, get in there between the decentralized application and their users because that's that's silly. That's just reducing the utility of the decentralized application for the users. Because if the users had to care about the dot token or had to care about how to interact with Polkadot or any any of the other stuff to do with Polkadot, then it would be a distraction from them using the decentralized application. Furthermore, it really just means as soon as you intermediate a platform between the, the application that sits on the platform and the users um, of the application, you're effectively um, you're effectively restricting the users of the application to a large extent to the users of the platform. Like to put it concretely, it's really hard to use any smart contract on Ethereum if you don't already own Ether, because otherwise you have to discover not only the smart contract, but you also have to discover Ether. You have to buy Ether, which means signing up to an exchange, funding the exchange, doing any ID requirements of the exchange, getting Ether, sending Ether out from the exchange into an account, <laughs> and then presumably doing something on the decentralized application from the account. That's a huge amount of effort to go to for someone that doesn't already know Ethereum. Realistically, your target audience is going to be people that hold Ethereum anyway, roughly know how to use it. Maybe they've got MetaMask in the browser. They understand the concept of an Ethereum uh, Ether account. Like, and that's, that's a big problem if we want to hit the mainstream. So Polkadot is really about ensuring that it's delivering an application platform, a decentralized application platform to developers and allowing them and their application to interact with the users directly without having any intermediary involved. Got it. So, um, for example, Akala, an application built on, on Polkadot, users of Akala don't require a DOT to pay for transaction costs. They, they exactly. just can go and buy a, a Akala token um, right. directly. So where does the value of DOT come, come from? Like, what's the tokenomics there? So um, the we don't want to um, economically um, disconnect DOT from the success of its parachains, quite the opposite. What we want to do is ensure that the users of the parachains of these decentralized applications don't need to care in for their day-to-day -day activity. So what we do is we say um, <clears throat> a parachain can deploy on Polkadot if it... Uh, if it either is a common good parachain, so basically a, a, a piece of functionality that is useful in and of itself to dot token holders. So that's one way. But assuming that that's not what's happening, then what we have these auctions. So the idea is that we, we auction off this um, these 100 or 200 or whatever parachain slots. So these, these like little blocks of, of sort of land, <laughs> uh, polka dot land. To, uh, to teams and teams are uh, teams can bid on these slots and if they win one then they get to deploy their decentralized application into Polkadot and um, and that's it and then they can appeal to their users in whatever way they want without the worry of having their users having to be exposed to uh, the dot token so this is uh, these auctions I, you know these auctions happen as a as a, as a, a lockup. So there's no there's no dot tokens paid out exact by the by the teams. They don't have to raise like a large portion of dot tokens and then hand them to the protocol. Really, it's it's about locking them up, um, and their dot tokens are locked up for as long as the um, as the, the the parachain team holds this um, this lease this slot. Um, uh, at the moment, that's a two year lease for Polkadot. So it's basically um, the parachain team agrees to bid I don't know, whatever a million dot tokens and uh, and then these million dot tokens are locked up for two years and two two years later the team gives up its parachain slot and it gets these million tokens back again now the um the the interesting components of this well how is a team gonna gonna find a million tokens to to put a bid in for a slot um, I mean, maybe they have a lot of DOT tokens, that's a possibility, but if they don't, then what do they do? They could loan, they could maybe get a loan 
from maybe maybe there's a VC or I don't know someone that's that wants to support them. They might loan them this this million tokens for two years. Um, it's important to say that the 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 tokens are guaranteed by the protocol. So it's like um, they will definitely definitely get their million tokens back again. That's not. Um, that, that's not a, a risk. Um, the other way of doing it that we introduced is this concept of crowd loans. So it's a bit like crowdfunding, except um, each of the people in the crowd get their, they only loan dot tokens. They don't, they don't, they don't buy anything. They don't, they don't, you know, give anything. Um, they loan their dot tokens. And again, this is trust free. It's part of the protocol, which means they are absolutely guaranteed to get their dot tokens back again. And this allows a team to basically say, um, hey, we think our parachain is going to be great. Um, you should support us. And it allows them to sort of go out and try and get support and have people um, uh, put their dot tokens in and maybe help them you know, get a big enough bid to get a, get, to get a slot in the auction. Um, now, the team might say, well, if you help us get a slot, we will give you some sort of reward. And so you end up with these sorts of uh, these parachain teams offering offering deals whereby uh, people who loan them enough dots for their parachain slot get some uh, some tokens back uh, or whatever else. But interesting, the reward can be fairly free form. So you know, at the moment we've seen rewards that have basically been we'll give you uh, we'll take five percent of our token base and, and hand it out to. Uh, to, to people that, that have helped us get a slot. Um, that's uh, that's fair enough. That's one way of doing it. There are others. One of them might be, well, you just give, um, uh, you give the uh, an NFT, which allows you to become a collator. And that coll the being a collator, so basically like a validator, sort of, uh, gets you some, um, uh, gets you a, a, some, po some tokens every, uh, yeah, a every block that you validate. So you can like maybe appeal to people's, uh, if not handing them sort of tokens out immediately, you can sort of hand tokens out um, over a sort of ongoing period, uh, or you can use it as a key to unlock some functionality within the chain, like for example, becoming a collector or some other some other like keeper um, role that the chain might have. Um, so there's, or you could maybe have, make it so you get a particular reduction in the chain services. Um, there's all sorts of ideas that 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 that. that are out there that um, chains might choose to implement. This podcast is sponsored by Sirion. Sirion is mission control for Web3, giving users the ability to trade DeFi tokens, transfer assets across chains, and show off their NFT collections all in one place. Sirion offers a multi-chain experience with asset tracking and trading across seven networks, including Polygon, Optimism, Arbitrum, and BSC so you'll never miss an opportunity waiting on gas fees to drop. NFT owners can also see their favorite collectibles and art widgets on their iPhones or Apple Watches and send them to friends and family in a few clicks. Users can explore every corner of the metaverse with Sirion from their web, desktop, and mobile apps. Head to Sirion.io to connect your wallet and get started today. So Dot uh, is the, the values driven from uh, teams who want to participate in the ecosystem and and uh, build on on parachains, not through kind of uh, the application users themselves. And so, so far, how many parachains have been auctioned? Um, on Polkadot, uh, mm -hmm. we are uh, we have um, uh, six active parachains. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, <laughs> unless you're going to correct me. How, how much are they going for? Uh, well, um, I believe the, the biggest one um, was, uh, oh, you know what? I'm not, I'm not actually sure. I think, um, I think we're in the, the millions though. Uh, really? Remember. Yeah, I think mm. it was like one, one or two. Yeah, in the single digit percentages of maybe by one and a half, two percent of total dot issuance per mm -hmm. slot for the initial ones. Although, um, yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really terrible on the, um, the financials. <laughs> okay, so, so these teams are raising about a, a million worth or so of dot tokens and staking the 
staking them in in the polka dot ecosystem and then like when 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 they want to leave or whatever when they're done with their like renting a paratain then they can take those dot tokens back uh essentially is yes. that how it works okay um and then you're saying that they the teams can either kind of buy these dots or 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 borrow them from uh, investors or from the community itself who uh, will then get some something in return uh, 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 a yield in tokens or maybe a discount in whatever application they're building or you know some something in return for their for their crowd loan precisely awesome um okay and then uh, what there's also kusama so I, i'd like to kind of like also get that breakdown like because there's like so many different terms that I, I'd want to clear up. So like there's substrate, which I understand is like a framework for, for building uh, parachains. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then, and then Kusama is uh, like a separate uh, relay chain, but yeah. Can you explain like how that differs from, from Polkadot itself? And, and I understand there's like a bunch of parachains on, on Kusama. So like how do all these different pieces within the Polkadot ecosystem integrate? That's right. So um, yeah, Substrate is a uh, is a parachain um, framework. So it's like a toolkit for making making uh, chains. Interestingly, it's not just for parachains. It's also uh, used to make Polkadot and Kusama itself. So it's uh, it's able to create blockchains of any any kind, um, and it's designed to be super modular so that uh, it's. Uh, it's, you know, we can do all of the various interesting stuff that we want to do with Polkadot and we can do all, you know, we can evolve it and, and, and you know, bring in different consensus algorithms and different ways of, of handling shards and all this kind of stuff down the line. Um, it's, um, so with regards to the difference between, uh, yeah, Kusama and Polkadot. So yeah, they're both relay chains. So they're both fairly similar to each other in terms of technology. Um, Kusama is like our, we call it our canary network, which basically means it's where, um, it's where we try out new technology uh, and new ideas before, um, before we think, before we're sort of ready to put it on Polkadot. Um, Polkadot's like, you know, it's a, it's a high value network and we don't want to risk the possibility of deploying new technology into Polkadot uh, and and, uh, and and having it you know break or, or something. So, Kosama, although we do a lot of testing before it even gets to uh, gets anywhere close to Polkadot, um, at the end of the day, uh, it's very difficult. Like these are very complex systems, and it's very difficult to predict um, uh, with certainty how um, how some change is going to uh, affect. Um, and so we deploy it to a system of comparable complexity, Kusama in this case, um, and with comp like with some substantial economic uh, uh, um, uh, uh, economy behind it, right? Um, in order to um, yeah try it try it out, see if it see how it works. Now this is. This, this is for two, there are two sort of classes of new thing that we try on Kosama before we try on Polkadot. And one of them is, um, one of them is just general new technology. So for example, the parachains, the, the, the parachains code, this was all tried on Kosama before it moved over to Polkadot. Um, and uh, uh, Kosama actually has way more validators than Polkadot. It has a thousand, I think more than a thousand validators now. Um, so this, this really, and it's generally the people who are, who are the validators for Kusama are running on like not, not such good hardware compared to Polkadot validators, just because mm -hmm. less is paid out for the Kusama validators. And so we can really get a good feel if it works on the Kusama, it's probably going to be okay on Polkadot. Um, the second thing that we try out on Kusama are, are ideas that we don't even necessarily want on Polkadot. We may never even make it to Polkadot. Things like, uh, ideas for governance. So, um, you know, governance is a relatively um, new frontier for blockchain. And it's, it's, um, there's a lot of interesting ideas that I and others have for, um, you know, um, for trying to get the wisdom of the crowd or the wisdom of the market or whatever involved in the decision-making 
uh, for blockchain rather than you know default to this benevolent dictator that sort of um, ethereum seems to have got into or this uh, utter shambles <laughs> that bitcoin has sort of uh, gone into we really want to uh, want to get good governance and um one of the you know we, we there are a lot of different kind of ways that we can bring people together to get decisions made and um you know there are all sorts of different voting mechanisms all sorts of uh, uh different kind of government government bodies that you might want to introduce for checks and balances for making sure some things go faster making sure some things take more time um so there's there are a lot of different areas um, of experimentation, a lot of different, lot, a very big design space in governance uh, systems, especially now that we have blockchain that helps us, um, uh, you know, sort of do things that would otherwise not be possible when we have to use more like in-person systems, um, as oftentimes in the past governance was constrained with. So, um, Kosama provides a really good platform for trying out these kinds of these new ideas of like governance structures or social structures for decision making. And um, uh, one of them was the Kosama Society. So this is this is a piece of functionality that's on Kosama. It never made it to Polkadot, probably will never make it to Polkadot. Um, and with the idea being that, you know, it's, you know, how can we what social structures can we build that, that can do things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do? And, um, and so, yeah, it fulfills experiments. Uh, it, it facilitates experiments in two kind of key directions. One of them being, let's make sure that this isn't going to break polka dot. And the other one being, um, let's really push the boat out and see what we can, uh, what we can do in this, re in, in this particular direction of technology. Very cool. So do you envision, Within the Apocalypse ecosystem, basically there only being these two uh, chains, uh, Polka, uh, Kusama as the like test net and Polkadot as the main net with all its different parrot chains, or will there be multiple like different relay chains that may use Substrate? Um, I suspect that we may see one or two others. The ones mm -hmm. that we are seeing at the moment are um, like um, consortium chains. So chains where a particular um, industry has a bunch of like um, uh, like individual um, um, organizations, companies, whatever. They want to come together and like, I don't know, interact in some way. Um, and But they don't necessarily want to be part of a public network. Maybe they don't see the, the reason why they should join another network's economy. Um, uh, for this, Polkadot actually provides um, that there is good arguments why Polkadot is, is more valuable, um, more, more reasonable proposal, because, of course, it doesn't try to intermediate itself in, in all the transactions. Uh, but in principle, it may be that we find that relay chains, um, particularly relay chains that ultimately are bridged into the Polkadot, eco, uh, Polkadot relay chain, um, may, may, be, uh, may become part of the Polkadot, um, sort of wider Polkadot ecosystem. Um, I think it's it's fair to say that, um, at least speaking for myself, um, that, uh, you know, relay chains that don't provide any key advantage over Polkadot or Kusama um, probably are not, like, we're not really going to see. I mean, they, they would just be sort of standard copycat things. And I mean, yeah, they will probably exist, but they're, they're not going to be sort of... Um, uh, welcomed with open arms, let's say. Got it. Um, do you have a hard stop or can you go for a, a, a few more minutes? I got a few more minutes. Oh, awesome. Okay. So, um, okay. Within this, uh, this, um, place where we are in, in blockchain industry with multiple uh, layer ones, uh, competing against each other, uh, where do you see Polkadot? Like, do you believe, um, Polkadot will become kind of the, the main blockchain ecosystem that will attract most developers and users, or do you see, um, you know, a, a place where all of these different layer ones will uh, interconnect with, with bridges, um, another, maybe another option. Uh, what's your take? 
Um, I mean, I, you know, there was an article uh, put out a few weeks back by Vitalik basically saying, you know, bridges are <laughs> bridges are broken. Like, don't don't do stuff on bridges. Um, and broadly speaking, I'm, I'm in agreement. Um, I think uh, I, I think bridges probably have a, a, a fairly a small role to play, um, but uh, overall, uh, I think that they are um, they suffer from what's called the inverse network effect, which basically means um, they're secure enough for light amounts of, of financial traffic, of value of value traffic, but they are definitely not secure enough if that if they turn out to be very important and traffic grows then they become increasingly insecure because the security of the bridge is basically fixed but yet the value of the of the traffic um can grow re- very you know substantially um and at some point the value of the traffic outweighs the security of the bridge and at that at that point it's you know it's only a matter of time before someone attacks it um Bridges are, uh, they may well be reasonable as long as the traffic, the the value of the traffic is kept reasonably low. So basically as long as the bridge doesn't get used too much. Um, But um, to architect an ecosystem over bridges would be asking for trouble. Um, And uh, and so, yeah, I don't see, um, I don't see that as being a viable uh, uh, way forward. Um, I I do think there will be a f- I can see a, a, a degree I, I, I'm not I'm not really sure I I would I would hope that we retain a degree of um, at least two or three different major chains and different major architectures um, whether uh, like we always we always sort of talk about Polkadot as a layer zero in that it, it's not a chain that has really, um, it doesn't really do anything itself beyond secure other chains, secure its shards, secure its power chains. Um, and these are the things that provide applications to users. And so I can, I can see that, uh, I think it's not far-fetched to imagine a world where, um, that, you know, there really are just, you know, one or two um, layer ones that can just about secure themselves, and then um, a few, or, or maybe even just one layer zero um, that is um, that is securing the rest of uh, of, of the sort of blockchain um, uh, ecosystem. But I don't know. It's my my main um, driving uh, factor at this point is um, to ensure that we provide the very best platform for developers, because in my mind, it's not about user acquisition at this point. Um, It's about developer acquisition and ensuring that we have the most compelling applications and that we have the most compelling platform for applications to be deployed onto. Um, It's uh, it's very important that this, uh, in my mind, that that application providers, decentralized application providers can effectively like market their service to individuals without having to get them to buy into the platform that they happen to put their service on. This in my mind is, is, is crucial for mainstream adoption. And so really um, what I'm focused on with Polkadot is making sure that that, re- that is the reality for Polkadot because it's not the reality for any other chain and that, um, you know, the APIs and the overall like framework is uh, is good to work with, um, and uh, yeah, uh, we uh, and we'll probably play around and make a few little test applications, demo applications of our own because it's uh, firstly it's fun and secondly it's uh, it's a good way of, of dog fooding of testing out your own stuff, making sure mm. that it's it's good. Okay, so in uh, in this, uh, going to the original p- question, in this world where uh, there is one layer zero, which is Polkadot, and then a few um, layer ones, would these layer ones be like parachains? Yeah. Right. Um, 
that, that's interesting. So in, in that kind of likely future, then like Polkadot just like wins and, and there is not like not many other uh, blockchains that uh, that are are being used. Yeah, I mean, I would I would look upon it like a um, Polkadot is a security alliance at the end of the day, right? It's it's a way of of allowing um, it, the different parachains to come together and um, and put value, give value through their own utility to an overarching uh, token, the DOT token, in order that they be secured because they they gain their security from Polkadot's consensus, right? That's really that's the that's the economy. That's where um, uh, that's that the value of DOT is really just providing. Um, security and messaging between the chains. So, if we if we look at it in that way, does there need to be more than one security system? Like, does there need to be more than one? Like, to take a, a very uh, timely example, does there need to be more than one NATO? I mean, if if the purpose if the purpose of it is basically like join this and you won't be attacked. <laughs> and it seems to me that um, there's no reason not to join it. Like if it's fair and, and transparent and open and da, 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 you know, assuming that it fulfills what it says on the tin, then it seems to me that there's really no reason not to, not to be, uh, not to subscribe to the, the security that is um, the one that everyone else is under. Um, if that's the case, uh, another way of saying it is that security is, has network effects right mm -hmm. like it's more valuable to be under the uh, a, a security system that 90 percent of of the value is under than that 10 percent of the value is under um and so and similarly with messaging there's exactly the same network effect it's like it's more valuable to be in the messaging service that 90 percent of the blockchain world is under than 10 percent of the blockchain world is under um messaging and security go hand in hand in the consensus environment simply because if you act on a message, so if you receive a message and do something, and then it turns out that the sender of the message was not finalized, was not, was, was not the final thing or was in some sense corrupted, then you have a problem because you have, you've already acted on the message. Um, and it's, it's hard for you to wind yourself back. And it may be that you've then part of your action was to tell someone else to do something and now they can't now they're doing something and they can't wind themselves back and ah, it all gets very messy um and what this kind of um messiness where you know there's an initial problem and that problem uh sort of infects something else which infects something else which goes on and on and on and on and infects the entire sort of con wider consensus system this is a similar um set up to the fine to the thing that caused the 2008 financial crisis it's this idea that you've got this initial bad asset right that's 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 coming out of wherever um the u.s subprime property market and it's basically wrapped given to someone else someone else then wraps it up gives it to someone else and, da, 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 da. and before you know it um everyone is is building you know huge amounts of um of, of financial like derivatives on top of this thing everyone's holding it it's a huge huge problem and then you find out oh the initial thing was broken was bad and now the the rug is pulled from under the entire um the, the wider industry um this is basically the case if you try and connect blockchains without uh having shared security um the rug can be pulled when one one that sends a message turns out to be a bad one. ET is a DeFi protocol that empowers other crypto projects like OneInch, Uniswap, Shapeshift, Filecoin, Fuse Network, Dodo, and others with community-controlled DeFi capabilities. Thanks to ET's groundbreaking DeFi 2.0 protocols, crypto projects can finally keep revenue from stablecoins and liquidity programs. ET enables crypto projects to create a sustainable economy that attracts users and keeps value locked in their communities. Learn more at ET.org. Gavin wants to turn Polkadot into a multi-chain powerhouse, where financial systems and web apps can run and interact seamlessly. It's the base for a Web3 future, 
a concept Gavin has been passionate about since before it was cool, and one he still believes in. Um, I think we are in a period of a sort of semi-golden era of, of blockchain at the moment, um, in that we're, there, are, there are a few different directions that are being explored. Um, and I don't think uh, that level of experimentation is going to continue indefinitely. Um, I think um, I find it hard to see um, there being more than um, a few very high value chains, like sec chains who secure themselves, right? Um, I think it's because securing yourself is kind of costly. It requires a lot of capital um, and kind of pointless if you can do it some other way. Like che it's just it's cheaper and easier to do it some other way. Um, so I don't think that we're going to see very many of them. And the ones that we see will likely each do different things. They'll have different design trade-offs. That, that are each valuable in their own right. And it may be that a, a very scalable, actually decentralized smart contract chain has its own security for, for, you know, for the foreseeable future. Maybe, I don't know. Um, but I think thus far, um, Polkadot is the only chain that really provides the same, uh, really provides this uh, parachain product, which is basically like the ability to secure um, any any other chain um, that is uh, um, that's novel and I think it's actually very valuable so if um, so if we think about global levels of transacting like okay I'm not really sure at what point we decide to like layer like go to light layer two and say well we don't really need all of the security that, that is under you know, Polkadot or Bitcoin or whatever. For example, do we really need that level of security to count the number of likes that a particular post has? Maybe, maybe not. Arguable, definitely arguable. Um, but we, uh, we, we will probably see, um, at the moment we're aiming for Polkadot to have of the order of about a million transactions per second that it can support under its primary consensus. Um, so basically with, with the same level of security as the Polkadot relay chain. Um, uh, we already have designs for systems that would be um, kind of layer one and a half or layer, layer a half in Polkadot's terminology. Um, so basically um, chains that roughly part of Polkadot's um, uh, sort of overall consensus, but they have like a sort of separate consensus of their own, which gets eventually folded into Polka, Polkadot's consensus. So there's kind of like a sub-consensus or like a mini consensus. And with the idea being that we could get um, a huge amount more transactions through on these. So we go from maybe a million transactions per second to maybe uh, up to... 100 million transactions per second maybe that kind of that kind of level uh, maybe even maybe even more 100 100 million to a billion and then from there potentially even further um but uh um yeah i think i think aiming it over the next 3 to 5 years for like uh having in the hundreds of millions of transactions per second is where we should be looking um, while retaining decentralization. Okay, so does that mean that you do see uh, Pogoda being able to sustain like just like global uh, economic activity? Um, I think, uh, I mean, I, I haven't actually taken the time to measure how much, uh, how much that would be, but I mean, it's certainly way or higher orders of magnitude than Visa would be able to process. So if right. if Visa is any kind of miles, uh, yardstick, then yeah, it's, uh, yeah, we're definitely looking to to push that by maybe a, a thousand, a thousand X. Got it. And then to, to wrap up, um, I wanted to wrap up with, uh, with Web3. 
uh, because you know th this is something that you've been um, talking about for a very long time, uh, probably before most people had uh, kind of heard of of the the, the term. Um, you wrote this uh, th this piece on it on Web three in 2014. Um, if you can just like uh, go over what Web three is for you, um, but Specifically, what what I really want 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 to get into is the criticisms to Web three um, and how how you look at them. Um, recently, there's been kind of this this blow blowback uh, uh, or pushback from um, large groups of people who are against NFTs and think that Web three is adding unnecessarily adding uh, kind of money and like financializing activity online. Um, also, you know, how a governance, like tokenized governance has uh, turned into like a, like it, it has turned like web applications into plutocracies. So just like unnecessarily adding like greed and money to the internet is kind of the common criticism to Web3. So yeah, I wanted to hear your, your thoughts on it, given that you've given, you know, you've been thinking about this for a while. So Web3 for me is, an, is not cryptocurrency it's not blockchain it's not tokenomics um mm. web3 for me is decentralization um it's openness it's transparency and it's the ability to um have absolute technical guarantees on um what your expectations uh, are and ensure that they've been met um so i I don't, I should not need to trust Facebook in order to send a message to my friend. I should not need to trust my bank in order to send money to my father, right? It, it's, that, that, that should not be the case. I don't, I never used to need to do that, right? It used to be, um, assuming that you know, my father was next to me, I could transfer money to him by giving him a 10 pound note. There you go. There's some money, right? That transfer happened. No, no bank. I didn't need to trust any bank to do it. I can talk to my father. I can, oh, my friend. I can say, hey, if they're right next to me, um, I don't need to trust uh, Mark Zuckerberg. This, this idea of building trust into everything is lazy, right? It comes about from laziness. It's because it's easier to architect something if you give yourself the right of God, <laughs> as the developer, as the service provider. Um, it's harder to do it when you don't, but that's nonetheless what we should be doing in this era where we have uh, people, very powerful people in the world that are doing their best to try to um, uh, kill off the concept of a free society. Um, we have no choice but to enshrine these guarantees of privacy and these basic rights into software, into the very technology that we use so they, so that they, it cannot be worked around and it, no individual can be lent upon to break these rules. Um, this is crucial if the free world is going to survive. That's, that's, my, that's my thought. And Web3 is a technology set that allows us to do these kinds of things, that these massively multi-user applications, these web applications, these internet applications. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a set of technologies that allows us to build internet applications that are not susceptible to attack from those that would rather not have a free world. I love that answer. Okay, last question. How are you defiant? How am I defiant? Yes. Uh... Um, I, uh, or maybe you think you're not defiant, but I think you are. <laughs> I guess it takes a lot to stop me from, um, um, from continuing on the path that I want to continue. Um, but I'm not sure. I mean, I have a pretty clear idea about what it is that I want to build. And if people come along and say, uh, NFTs are bad, therefore you shouldn't build Web3, 
It's like, I, I have no problem defying them. Um, I, I suppose I'm defiant in so much as, um, you know, I have, I have my beliefs about what is, what is good engineering, what is good technology, um, the way that society should be, like the way that a good society should be, um, uh, in some sense, right and wrong. Like, um, I don't think, uh, the U S is war in Iraq was particularly right. And I think that a lot of crimes were committed that, um, that never got punished. And I think that is wrong. Um, and I don't want to, you know, I wouldn't single out the U S there's most countries have, have the skeletons in the closet, some more than others. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I think that openness and transparency is, uh, can be a very crucial tool in ensuring that society stays free and that in some sense, uh, the, the, the bigger rights and wrongs of the world get, um, um, uh, get become known. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm happy to defend my opinions on, on that. And I suppose in that sense, uh, I can be quite defiant. But I don't know. I I I prefer to build. I, I'm not. I'm not really out here to cause controversy. <laughs> Love it. Um, so I guess your your high convictions about uh, openness, transparency, decentralization can make you defiant um, if you're a talent. At least you you will you will build to see those things, those values play out. Awesome. Well, Gavin, uh, it was a pleasure uh, chatting with you. Thank you so much for extending the interview a, a bit longer. Um, uh, really valuable uh, hearing all about uh, Polkadot uh, from the man himself. So thanks again for joining me. Uh, again, really a pleasure. Likewise. Uh, lovely to chat, Camilla. Anytime. Mm -hmm.